So, as you've most likely seen by now, Ichigo has received quite the upgrade thanks to his stint in the Royal Palace. And wait, didn't we just do this video last week? Oh wait, that was about Renji and Rukia. Wow, there's a lot of people coming down from the Royal Palace at the moment, and each of them seemingly has something special to show off thanks to their time with the Divine Division. As the second Quincy invasion reaches the apex of its first half, and Kenpachi Zaraki finishes his cataclysmic battle with Gremi, only to be ambushed and nearly killed by the Bambis, Ichigo returns to the battlefield with the force of a shooting star descending from the heavens in an effort to help turn back the tide of the war. The Thousand Year Blood War arc has been criticised in the past for not giving Ichigo enough to do, and while it's true that he's missing for large portions of the arc at a time, other major characters like Kenpachi, Byakuya and Hitsugaya also take lengthy leaves of absence. The truth is that by the time the Thousand Year Blood War arc rolls around, this isn't just Ichigo's story anymore. The entire Gotei 13 has a stake in this fight, maybe even more so than he does. But that being said, Ichigo's return is a huge moment, both for him and the story. It's a long time coming culmination of his training with the Zero Division, training afforded only to a very select few. And thanks to the anime, we know even more than we did before about what Ichigo has gone through. So, just how powerful has our main character become now? Much like with the video on Renji and Rukia before it, this one might be a little messy, but I'm hoping it'll be fun too. So, let's take a look. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support from me another step further, I'd also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to say a massive massive thank you and give a huge shout out to everyone who is supporting me there over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. And yes, of course, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in this video to come, specifically for the latter half of the arc that hasn't yet been animated. Honestly, determining how truly strong Ichigo has become, thanks to his training in the Royal Palace, isn't quite as straightforward as it was with Renji and Rukia before him. The thing is, after their big fights against Master Masculine and Asnod respectively, Renji and Rukia kind of peak right there and run out of steam. As far as their involvement in this arc goes, they never get a showcase like that again, so we can cap those battles as being the best we get to see of the two of them, at least as far as the Thousand Year Blood War goes. With Ichigo, it's a little different. Even if you're not satisfied with the overall amount that he does in the arc, he remains involved until the very end, with his foes and battles escalating in a natural arc until finally facing off, of course, with Yuhabak himself. What that means is, although Ichigo's arrival in last week's episode and his subsequent battle against the Bambis is impressive, he still has plenty left to show in the tank as well, making him a little tougher to gauge than Renji and Rukia. Put it this way, unlike Renji and Rukia, who show up and hit the limit of what they're going to show in the Thousand Year Blood War arc pretty much straight away, Ichigo remains an untapped well, even after his initial reappearance. Before we really get started, Ichigo's time training in the Royal Palace is interesting when you take a top-down look at it. He and Renji begin their journey together, essentially, making their way through both Tenjiro and Hikifune's palaces at the same time. Of course, everything changes for Ichigo in Oetsu's palace, and he's forcibly returned to Karakura Town to learn the truth about the nature of his power when he fails the Asauchi's test. Meanwhile, Renji presumably continues onwards after succeeding. Presumably, at some point during Ichigo's time in Karakura Town, Rukia awoke in Tenjiro's palace and somehow caught up to Renji by the time they both reached Ichibei's dojo. Anyway, while we do get to spend time with Renji and Rukia during this training period, the reality is that what we actually got to see of their divine training itself is fairly superficial. At least where Ichigo is concerned, we dove a fair bit deeper and spent a considerable amount of time with him as he came to truly understand who he is, where his powers originate from, and what Zangetsu means to him as a spiritual being and as a Shinigami wielding a Zanpakuto. Obviously, the segment The Blade Is Me 
was the culmination really of Ichigo's entire arc up until this point. It was the end of his journey so far, of everything that has happened to him in the past, from old man Zangetsu rescuing him in his battle with Zarakita, fighting the fused version of his powers in Deicide and beyond. Ichigo is a very different person after his training in the royal palace. He's calm, confident, even aloof when confronted with multiple captain class opponents at once. However, Ichigo's training after he receives his true Zanpakuto from Oetsu was basically totally omitted in the source material, and we missed arguably the next most important part of it all, whatever trials Ichibei put him through. Thankfully, the anime chose this as something new to include and focus on, which I think was very smart. We see that Ichigo's training in particular was holy, as if gifted to him by God, in this instance the Soul King, and that has undoubtedly left its mark on Ichigo moving forward. With the permission of the Soul King himself, supposedly, Ichigo walked along Irazu Sando, the unapproachable path wherein he bore the brunt of the weight of everything he wants to protect. Ichigo's goal has always been to protect the things he cares about and to gain the strength necessary to do so. Here, at the end of the story where the stakes are at their highest, Ichigo is fighting to protect the world. All worlds, in fact, and he not only feels the heft of that burden on his back, but he also sees and understands the creation of the world as he knows it. Ichigo is flooded with knowledge in this moment, knowledge you have to imagine only a tiny handful of people at best actually know, let alone have actually peered into and experienced. By the end of it, a portion of Rayo's power is pumped through Ichigo to test his capabilities as a vessel. And when Ichigo emerges from Irazu Sando on the other side, he's a changed man. He's been enlightened. What I like most about Ichigo's training with the Zero Division is that it was less about physicality. Usually training sequences like these involve a lot of fighting, of pushing the characters and their bodies to their limits, and while there absolutely is some of that on display here, with Ichigo sweating and heaving as he struggles to press on, the training of the Royal Palace seems to be mostly training of the soul itself, and I think that helps to impart its importance on we, the readers. So, when Ichigo returns from the Royal Palace in the anime, we really understand to a much better degree what he's been through and what he now carries with him that he didn't before. An awakening of himself and his power, which is where that confidence ultimately comes from. And you know, there's something very satisfying about seeing Ichigo this way. As the hero of the story, we want him to succeed. And Ichigo has truly been through it all, from vicious beatdowns to mind-bending manipulation and scheming, breaking down and losing all hope, and yes, even actual death and resurrection. Ichigo has always felt quite unique, I think, as far as traditional hero-type characters go. He's often tormented by very real, very human issues of depression and struggles with self-worth, despite being more than capable of achieving his goals. So, to see him at long last, standing tall, decorated in the garb of the royal realm, is very gratifying for those of us who have been in the trenches with him. This is a markedly different Ichigo from the one who was sobbing in the rain after Ginjo's betrayal, yet the seeds of this form, of this version of him, are being planted here. They are laid bare, waiting to grow. From the moment he defiantly screams for Ginjo, despite being powerless himself, to his confident aura upon receiving his Shinigami powers once again, these are some early snippets of who Ichigo truly is inside, of who he can be. And here we've reached that point now, in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, where this version of him is no longer the outlier, reserved for triumphant moments, but just who he has become as a man and a Shinigami. Really, the closest Ichigo has come to radiating this sense of power before was, of course, Dangai Ichigo, and even then, he was on a timer, essentially. Of course, there are plenty of examples of the strong and confident Ichigo appearing before the Lost Agent arc, but I chose that moment to focus in on because it really is Ichigo at his emotional lowest, and yet even still in that moment, he chooses to stand eventually and fight, even though he's powerless really to do so. So, I said a lot there. I said this video might be messy and it's already become more introspective than I think I had planned. But, to get to the crux of the matter, just how powerful did his training in the palace really make him? Can we even quantify it? 
It's difficult to know how powerful, for example, the Bambis actually are, since the four of them don't fight fair. And I'm not going to hold that against them, I gave them their dues in this regard before. It makes total sense for them to ambush Kenpachi and not give him a chance to fight back, but it does make it slightly trickier to work out how strong they really are when they're not busy massacring mooks. Even so, we know that every Sternritter is at least captain level, whatever that really means these days, in terms of their Reiatsu, and later on, Lil Toto and Meninus are the only two of a group of Sternritter to even remotely stand up to Byakia. Here, though, in a scene that mirrors Ichigo's effortless defeat of three vice captains in the Soul Society arc, he's now tossing around all four of these Sternritter like they're ragdolls, punching and slinging them into nearby buildings without so much as a care in the world. Before we get to any of that though, there's Ichigo's speed to discuss. Ichigo has always been very fast. Remember when Incredible Speed was supposedly Tensor Zangetsu's actual ability? But here we really see it on display. For starters, there's Ichigo's journey back from the Royal Palace. It does make me laugh a little seeing how the idea of Shunpo has totally changed in a sense, Shinigami could never actually fly, rather they used Reishi to essentially stand in the air upon footholds that they created for themselves in the sky. But here Ichigo is quite literally rocketing down to earth at an unbelievable speed, and we even see him boost in mid-air to pick up some extra speed as he hurtles through the sky. He's capable of completing a week-long journey in half a day, and when he does arrive in the Seireite, he's barreling through the sky so fast that he can't even control his landing, comically slamming into a tower instead of landing gracefully. Ichigo is then able to appear behind the Bambis in the blink of an eye and in such a casual manner too. He's moving so swiftly at this point that they simply can't keep up, and you see this threaded throughout the battle with them as well. For example, when Candice tries to attack him from behind, we don't see Ichigo move. Instead, he's already grabbed her wrist from above before tossing her aside. That should give you an idea of what they're now dealing with and why they're finding it so hard to even hurt him. It's like fighting a wraith or something. To them, as far as their perception allows, Ichigo must simply blink in and out of existence. One minute they're lunging for him, the next they're receiving a punch to their gut, and they don't really know what transpired in between. Then of course there's Ichigo's demeanour. Just look at his face throughout this whole ordeal. He speaks to Kenpachi with a grin, the two of them sharing a light-hearted moment together, yet the instant Ichigo is jumped from behind, his expression continues to remain one of fairly carefree ambivalence. The only time he shows any kind of shock or surprise is when his cloak is snagged by Lil Toto's The Glutton, and even then it's played out for laughs, like Ichigo can't believe how weird this ability is that he's suddenly confronted with. The fact of the matter is, none of them even get remotely close to Ichigo throughout the entire showdown. The four of them attack him all at once, blasting him with high lig file, but according to Lil Toto, Ichigo simply deflects them all away, and simultaneously manages to send Candice flying again without any effort at all. Bear in mind as well that Ichigo is only using Shikai here. A point was made about how captains like Hitsugaya and Soifon were unable to handle their Sternritter opponents without Bankai, yet in Shikai Ichigo is merely playing games with four of them at once. This fight also showcases the strangest, yet also one of the most impressive usages of Getsuga Tensho ever. Ichigo has grown so strong, so skilled, that he's able to draw out the essence of Getsuga from his shorter Quincy blade, by simply scraping the sky with his blade, he leaves a sliver of Getsuga lingering in the air, which is enough to completely nullify Candice's Galvano Javelin on impact. Use this image to help yourself visualise how incredible this really is. We've seen Ichigo use Getsuga Tensho before in such a way that it collides with other attacks in mid-air, cancelling each other out. For example, when both he and Ginjo launch massive Getsuga blasts at each other, or when he and Grimjo collide with Getsuga and Sero in midair during their final fight, or even when Ichigo uses Getsuga to negate Kirge's arrows at the start of the Thousand Year Blood War. Yet here, this is merely a tiny portion of Getsuga being simply left in place. Ichigo does nothing with it, there's no exertion here. He merely allows Candice's attack 
to slam into it, quickly showing how worthless even attacks in her Volston dish are. It's a shame that Ichigo never uses Getsuga Tensho in this inventive way again. After this fight, he returns to using Getsuga in a fairly standard fashion, which I think diminishes how special the attack has become overall. Even Ichigo's new ability, Getsuga Jujisho, while used in such a casual manner by the hero, is completely devastating. It's drawn in such a way by Kubo that it seems to swallow up the sky whole, completely engulfing Candice and dispelling her most powerful attack with ease. When Ichigo is later surrounded on all sides by an incredible eight stern Ritter at once, he isn't phased at all. The only time he shows a shred of worry is when he realises Yuhabak is planning on invading the royal palace, which kicks him into action. Now it's here that we see Ichigo get a little careless as he tries to rush the Quincy King. He allows Meninas to get the drop on him, but even being forced headfirst through numerous buildings doesn't hinder him at all, as noticed by Robert. And Ichigo is able to avoid Robert's point-blank blast and still swing his sword at the Sternritter to put distance between them before Basby grabs him. Now Ichigo does definitely look concerned about Basby's attack, but I think it's more due to the fact that he knows he can't avoid it, not that he's worried about how much damage it might do. Of course that's all speculation on my part, maybe Burner Finger 1 at close range like that would have hurt Ichigo a lot, but Ichigo's also just seen it be used to not great effect on the Bambis themselves earlier. The key to this scene is that really these Sternritter are little more than a nuisance to him now. Much like Aizen once said in the Deicide arc, allow me to be careless for I no longer have any need not to be, Ichigo doesn't feel the need to have his guard up around these Sternritter. He needs to focus on reaching Yuhabak, and the fact that they are throwing themselves at him to try and get in his way to be obstacles really means very little to him. Ichigo has his sights set on Yuhabak himself at this point. I will admit, it is weird to me that Ichigo doesn't just outright kill the Bambis immediately with his newfound power, especially when he realises that they were trying to actively finish off Kenpachi. After all, as Byakia says to Renji in the first invasion, these people are trying to annihilate the Soul Society. They are unequivocally the enemy. Cut them down with everything you have. That should have been the mantra of the entire Gote 13 throughout the war, but it seems like Ichigo missed that memo somewhere along the way. Of course, outside of the story, it's likely because Kubo didn't want to reveal what Ichigo could really do yet, though considering what happens to Ichigo as the story progresses, maybe it would have been better that he had. Ichigo doesn't really get involved in too many fights once Yuhabak ascends to the royal palace. Kubo seemed determined to save Ichigo for clashes against Yuhabak himself and Yuhabak alone, when really Ichigo should have had a proper fight against another Sternritter in the meantime. That being said, there is something special about the idea that Ichigo won't fight again, he's being reserved for when he reaches the king. They clash briefly atop the palace in the Soul King's throne room, but honestly there isn't a lot to say about it from Ichigo's perspective. Despite his newfound power, he doesn't achieve much here. Yuhabak is barely even registering him half the time, his gaze instead firmly fixed upon Reo and the surprise appearance of Mimihagi. After that, Ichigo is sent plummeting from the palace, and we don't get a read on how strong he is here at all. Really, when it comes to Ichigo's portrayal in this arc after returning from the royal palace, and this is a concept we'll return to later in this video, it feels like a pendulum swinging back and forth dramatically. At one point, Ichigo is running rings around eight Sternritter at once, looking completely untouchable. The next, he's being virtually ineffective against Yuhabak before being blasted from the palace rooftop. And I'm not saying I expect Ichigo to be able to stop Yuhabak here in this moment, but it's just that whiplash going from enemies he's able to totally walk around with no issue to the absolute big bad of the series with no real in-between. However, one thing I always liked about how powerful Ichigo became was that Kubo never lost sight of what kind of a fighter Ichigo is and his strengths and weaknesses and how that might work to both his benefit and his detriment. Although Ichigo doesn't really fight again for a while, one of the most infamous scenes from the Varvel invasion arc sees him confronting Askin and being quickly dispatched off screen by the Sternritter who turns him into a rug on the floor. Needless to say, this is a contentious moment. 
By all counts, even a Schutzstoffel like Askin shouldn't really be able to stand up to Ichigo in a 1v1 scenario, let alone defeat him with apparently no effort whatsoever. In terms of raw power at least, anyway, Ichigo should be miles above Askin. But Ichigo is a headstrong physical fighter and he always has been. That's not to say he's stupid or he doesn't think because that simply isn't true, but he is exactly the kind of fighter that someone like Askin excels against. Against. That kind of style plays exactly into Askin's hands. As a tricky fighter, Askin often lets his enemies defeat themselves rather than put in the work himself. And so this moment isn't in the story here to say that Ichigo is weak all of a sudden or that he's weaker than Askin, but to show that even this version of Ichigo, who's immensely strong, is still susceptible to a bad matchup at the end of the day, and I appreciate that. Maybe this scene could have been handled better. For example, I'd love for Ichigo and Askin to get a small extension to their confrontation in the anime that actually shows us what goes down. But I like that Kubo tries to keep Ichigo grounded pun not intended. After all, Ichigo has been openly compared to bloodthirsty characters like Kenpachi and Grimjo in the past, in terms of his mindset, in terms of the way he really feels about fighting, even if he doesn't let it show on the surface, and there's a nice parallel to Grimjo in this moment here too, I think, as earlier we see Grimjo attempt to swat away Askin's gift, only for it to paralyse him immediately. As I said, Ichigo has been compared openly to the more fight loving characters in the series before and he definitely errs on that side of the warriors spectrum more than anything else so you can easily imagine i think anyway a very similar scenario playing out between him and askin that occurred earlier with grimjo and then as we get to the final battle this is what kubo has been saving ichigo for and it's here that we'll get to see what he's really capable of right well, kind of, though once again Ichigo is up against the most broken being in the Bleach universe right now, who has only attained even more power since the last time they fought. When Ichigo steps into Yuhabark's throne room, the Quincy King mentions that Ichigo not drawing his sword should leave him vulnerable, except he isn't, as Yuhabark can almost see Ichigo's overflowing spiritual pressure taking physical form. I've always kind of wondered about this moment, can Yuhabark actually see that fiery image surrounding Ichigo, or is it more of a metaphor for our benefit for how Ichigo's Ratsu has become so ferocious and overwhelming that it appears to be surrounding him at all? sides. Much like, say, when Kenpachi removed his eye patch for the first time against Ichigo in battle. Of course, the crucial difference here is that Kenpachi didn't have any control over his power at all back then, and it just leaked out of him subconsciously, which is what used to happen to Ichigo. But here Ichigo has much greater control than he's ever had before. Since Ichigo doesn't actually seem to have this aura ebbing and flowing around him at all times, at least not that we see, although maybe Kubo's just drawing it like that so he doesn't have to make the panels very messy looking, does he simply allow it to flare up for a moment as he prepares to take on Yuhabak? It's possible absolutely that Ichigo's control over his Reiatsu has become so adept that he's able to do that. After all, in chapter 555, following his royal palace training, Hikafune mentions that it's hard to believe he used to have such shaky Reiatsu, so presumably he's now got a grip on that as well. To take it back to the Arankar arc for a moment, we see that when Ichigo tries to build a pathway in the Garganta, it is all over the place. He's not able to control it or stabilize it or anything. It's crumbling. Frankly, it's a danger to everyone running on it. However, now, like Unohana could back in that moment, I assume that Ichigo would be able to create a perfect, rigid pathway to run on. Either way, Ichigo's swirling Reiatsu seems to be taking the shape of the jaw of his hollow mask, obviously referencing white, while also possibly being a callback again to that Kenpachi battle where his Reiatsu took on the appearance of his inner hollow. It's also possible that this scene and imagery are supposed to be intentional references to Yamamoto and his Bankai, where the fire surrounding him with Zanjutsu West was actually his all-powerful Reiatsu taking physical shape. And don't forget as well that Yamamoto was able to make that visible and invisible at will, so perhaps Ichigo can now do the same thing. Yuhabak's following comment is interesting too, though I think fairly straightforward. He initially states Ichigo has grown strong before correcting himself and saying that this is the power Ichigo is supposed to have. So he's basically saying that this isn't growth, 
You've simply attained, unlocked, at last, the power that is rightfully yours as a perfect hybrid being. Then, of course, there's Ichigo's horn of salvation transformation. Thanks to the Blade Is Me, we know the source of Ichigo's power at last. And so does he. Ichigo inherited Shinigami powers from his father Ishin and Quincy powers from his mother Masaki. Masaki was bitten by the Hollow White, resulting in her holofication, after which Ishin stepped in to save her life, binding himself to the Hollow within her to keep her soul stable. Over time, that binding resulted in the mixing of Ichigo's own Hollow and Shinigami powers, meaning the two are now one and the same. These two beings, Ichigo's Quincy powers, and the fusion of his Shinigami and Hollow powers found equilibrium at long last when Ichigo finally learned the truth, and in that moment they were able to be forged into two separate blades. Ichigo notes that the equilibrium, the harmony, keeps Zangetsu in check. Yet, whenever Ichigo is struck by large amounts of power, be it Shinigami or Hollow, as we see from the examples showcasing his battles against Byakia and Yami respectively, Zangetsu rears his head and transforms Ichigo. So Ichigo decided to test that out once more, against a Quincy this time. After being attacked thoroughly by Yuha Bark's power, Zangetsu, lo and behold, does awaken, changing Ichigo completely. The difference here is that now that they understand one another, Ichigo maintains full control over himself in the process. Again, I like that Kubo didn't just immediately make Ichigo the master of his newfound power. He openly says to Yuha Bark that he can't really control it yet, and he really should be able to call out Zangetsu whenever he wants, but instead he has to let himself get beaten up first. So Ichigo still has room to grow, to become even stronger. Presumably in the future he'll just be able to activate this form at will. Once again, we don't see a lot of Ichigo's Horn of Salvation form, but what we do see is very impressive. His speed has become nigh imperceptible, as he simply steps forward, Orihime unable to comprehend when he moved in front of her shield. Once again, he's almost ghost-like and without form. Much like Yuha Bart did before, upon gaining the Soul King's power, Ichigo now uses his Reiatsu to blow apart the roof of the palace. As Yuha Bart compliments his strength, the Quincy King tries to draw his blade, but Ichigo is immediately upon him, grabbing Yuha Bark's hand and forcing the sword back before he can even really lift his weapon. Of course, as mentioned earlier, the pendulum swings dramatically. The fact Ichigo is fighting one of the strongest beings in Bleach right now means you'll never truly be able to get the most out of this form. Case in point being that despite being ridiculously fast, fast enough to blitz Yuha Bark, the moment Ichigo brings his sword down, Yuha Bark simply catches it in his bare hand. We then see Ichigo lift his Shinigami blade to his hollow horn, fusing together Getsuga Tensho with his own blood in order to create a mixture of Getsuga and Gran Rei Sero, launching the massive crescent moon-shaped strike at Yuha Buck. Again, this is amazing to see and something we've just never really seen before. The closest, of course, we get is the Vizards using Sero themselves. However, Ichigo is a true hybrid in action, casually fusing together a Shinigami and a hollow attack like it's nothing. This is the version of Ichigo we had basically been waiting years to see. With almost total control over all aspects of his power, Ichigo can now do... anything? Everything is afforded to him, and it's amazing to see him finally, at long last, utilise a Sero of his own accord. But again, much like with his speed earlier, while this moment is incredible to behold, initially the pendulum swings once more, and Yuha Bark simply crushes the Getsuga Sero in his hand before turning the tables completely, nullifying everything about this form. In this sense, the Horn of Salvation form, named for the chapter it first appeared in, is absolutely one thing I desperately want to see more of from Ichigo in the anime, as it's criminally underutilised in the source material. Speaking of criminally underutilised in the source material, as we reach the final point of this video, I feel like I maybe need to make a separate video entirely, really, to do it justice, but we need to look at Ichigo's Bankai. 
his true Bankai. Another thing I like about Ichigo's portrayal in the second half of the final arc is that he waits until the most dire moment before he finally uses Bankai. It really does feel like an actual trump card. Now, I get it. Again, Kubo wanted to save Ichigo's Bankai reveal for the very end, but narratively it works well too. Throughout the Rankar arc, Ichigo was often criticised for devaluing his own Bankai. Ichigo activates his Bankai during his final fight with Grimjo, then doesn't disengage it until the end of the Rankar arc, once he's lost his Shinigami powers. That's a frankly absurd amount of time to have your Bankai activated, and Ichigo's character was lambasted for robbing the idea of Bankai of its weight. Here, though, in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, that feeling of gravity has once again returned, as Ichigo spends almost the entire half of the arc in Shikai, which not only feels more natural, it also organically builds up anticipation for when the Bankai itself will finally be revealed. And it also serves to show how strong Ichigo has become, unlike the Iran Kar arc, which in many ways had the opposite effect. Ichigo was being tossed around in his Bankai by basically everyone, as I said, devaluing it over Overall, and making it appear weak or at the very least susceptible to absurd fluctuations. There's none of that in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Instead, Ichigo is fending off captain level opponents by the masses in Shikai alone, all the while crucially feeling like he's holding something back. Not only is it very impressive, but it also makes for a great spectacle. But regarding Ichigo's true Bankai itself, this is easily the weirdest, wildest Bankai portrayal in the series. After successfully building to Ichigo's Bankai reveal, making it feel like an inevitability as he confronts the new Soul King Yuhabak, who is now literally dripping with power, Kubo sprung one of the arc's craziest, most abrupt twists upon us. Having had his Horn of Salvation form defeated now that Yuhabak has activated the Almighty, Ichigo prepares to overcome both fate and despair once again upon at last activating Bankai. We briefly see the new new Tensor Zangetsu before it's instantly destroyed. No, in fact, it was already snapped in two, even before it materialised. I'm honestly fascinated to see how they handled this in the anime, all the way in Core 4, presumably, but nonetheless, this was a truly shocking moment. Certainly a Bankai reveal like no other. Using the almighty Yuhabak broke Tensor Zangetsu in the future before Ichigo could even use it. While this twist in itself is worth talking about, what's more important here is the why. Why did Yuhabak snap Ichigo's Bankai in two? If Yuhabak was so secure in his absolute power, power which, by the way, has been referenced numerous times, from his ability to just detonate the ceiling of the Soul King's throne room, to Kyoraku commenting on Yuhabak having such immense power that he's capable of restructuring the royal palace itself, then why did he feel the need to kneecap Ichigo just as he was getting going? The answer is simple. Even with the Almighty and the power of the Soul King, Yuhabak feared Tensor Zangetsu. He basically says as much himself when he compliments Ichigo on how dangerous his Bankai is. So dangerous, in fact, that he could not allow it to be. I wonder if Yuhabak envisioned the future in which he was actually killed successfully by Ichigo, which is interesting to think about, the future that is the actual ending of Bleach, and by breaking his Bankai, Yuhabak thought that the ending of Bleach wouldn't come to pass, but thanks to Tsukushima's help, it still does. Presumably, though, Yuhabak couldn't see the actual moment of his death, since he no longer possessed the Almighty in that split second. It's difficult to say, but maybe he saw that battle and decided it wasn't worth the risk. Or perhaps he was inspired to act by the vision Hashwalt shared with him, showing his death at Ichigo's hands. Though Yuhabak himself mistakenly believed that to be merely a dream, so I think the implication is that he doesn't act on it. So while we don't get to see a lot from Ichigo's Bankai, sadly, this is a cool moment of showing and not telling, having Yuhabak anticipate the destructive power of Ichigo's true Bankai to the point where he removed it entirely is a great way of telling the audience that Ichigo has something special here without getting the chance to show what it can do. And then of course there is the final battle itself. Again, Ichigo's true Bankai is barely used, 
but when it is, it really counts. After stabbing Yuhabak through the back, Ichigo activates Getsuga Tensho, the only one we ever see him use with his Bankai, and the final one we get to see in the series, ripping through the Quincy King and killing him almost immediately, his body turning into pure energy and splattering onto the ground at Ichigo's feet. I feel like this is an often overlooked moment, likely due to the inherent weirdness of the final battle itself, and how quickly everything is just moving at this point, but Ichigo really does just almost kill the current Soul King in a single hit with his Bankai. While his sword is embedded in his foe, he activates Getsuga, and we see in Bankai that it appears like a torrential wave of power, devastating everything in its wake. Putting everything else aside, this is that immeasurable, divine, destructive power that Yuha Bark was concerned about, and with good reason, as if he didn't have the Almighty activated, the Soul King would have been slain in that moment. This is a latent power, that of a Soul King candidate himself, who bears the Reatsu of all spiritual races on his back. Honestly, as with the Horn of Salvation before it, I wish we got to see more of Ichigo's true Bankai. This is one area that the anime has to expand on, hopefully substantially. Ultimately, the truth is that while Ichigo's growth arc is well portrayed in the Thousand Year Blood War, we don't get to see much in the way of the fruits of that arc. He needed, as I said, a strong middle-of-the-arc showcase that was more than just a total, almost lazy beatdown of the Bambis, to really help outline his current level. It's difficult, then, to get a firm idea of how powerful he's really become when the pendulum does swing so violently from one side to the next. While Ichigo returns from the royal palace with a newfound strength befitting of his stature as both the main character of Bleach and as a perfect hybrid of the spiritual races, he never really gets a chance to show it off, until the very end, that is, but even then, his shining moment initially is snatched away from him. But what can we glean from the short time we do spend with him. And when I say that, I'm not saying Ichigo doesn't get a lot of panel time in the arc, he does. It's just a crucial lack of actual time in combat on the page. Despite that, we learn a lot, and it paints a picture of an incredible power. Ichigo is almost certainly the strongest being in Bleach by the end of the story. In terms of pure, raw, spiritual power, his well of potential is limitless. It's that latent, unknowable depth to his strength that earned him a place on the special war powers list, and we see it in full force here. Now, does that mean that Ichigo automatically wins every fight in Bleach? Well, no. He might be the strongest in terms of overall averages, but he certainly isn't the most broken. As far as I'm concerned, Yuhabark's the Almighty is the single most hack special power in Bleach, and Ichigo would have never defeated him were it not for the still silver arrow at the last second. Sure, Ichigo is clearly more powerful than Yuhabark in a raw sense, even though Soul King Yuhabark does have the godlike strength necessary to rebuild his entire fortress from the rubble and cityscape thousands and thousands thousands of feet below, it's just Ichigo slaying him in a single blast of Getsuga Tensho is a divine feat in itself. Unfortunately though, Yuhabak can resurrect himself infinitely as long as he has the Almighty, so again, that pendulum swings, making things null and void. Even Ichigo's short tussle with Askin feels like a prelude to this, a warning even, that while Ichigo has unstoppable, unquenchable power, some enemies are just too dastardly with their tricky abilities. Like I said at the top of the video, it is messy. But as far as I'm concerned, by the end of the series, Ichigo definitely earns his spot at the peak of the power hierarchy. There are just some caveats to go with it, as there nearly always are. He's the absolute strongest thanks to everything he wields, but some characters are just too broken to defeat conventionally, I'm afraid. However, after his heavenly training in the royal palace, after he learns the truth of the origin and nature of his power, once he's walked the unapproachable road and bore the weight of the world he wants to protect, learned of its sacrificial inception and achieved harmony with his Zanpakuto, 
there can be no denying he is on a wholly different level altogether. In the anime, Ichibe makes numerous references to Ichigo surpassing a Shinigami. In this sense, I kind of wish the concepts of dimensions and transcendence had made a return from the Deicide arc, because it actually made the hierarchy quite easy to visualise. But as a perfect hybrid, Ichigo is presumably transcendent once more, having achieved a form that surpasses both Shinigami and Hollow, and I suppose Quincy now as well, naturally. Anyway, that's that. A messy, rambling, all over the place video, and one I plan to return to further into the anime, when hopefully we get an even better look at Ichigo's current power. Regardless, he's in a place now where, even without fully mastering his strength, he's capable of walking circles around numerous captain level characters at once, without even breaking a sweat, and moving so fast he's invisible to the senses, controlling, summoning, and combining hollow abilities with his Shinigami powers, and yes, even killing God. If there is ever a hell arc, whoever the main villain is, better be seriously overpowered. But that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. How do you feel about where Ichigo currently is in regards to his power? Am I right about saying he is the most powerful being in the universe, but there are some characters who are so broken that they can still defeat him in a 1v1 fight? Ichigo's powers do certainly now seem to encroach upon the territory of the divine, but I'd love to know if you feel like I'm right about this or if I'm off base regarding where Ichigo is as of the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this video in general, this topic, where you think Ichigo is in relation to everyone else in the series. Do please let me know down in the comments below. Make sure to hit subscribe if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.